I want you to turn again to Judges chapter 3, verse probably 11 onwards. The land had rest for 40 years. Then Othniel, the son of Kenaz, died. And the children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord strengthened Eglon, king of Moab, against Israel, because they had done evil in the sight of the Lord. Then he gathered to himself the people of Ammon and Amalek, went and defeated Israel, and took possession of the city of Babs. So the children of Israel served Eglon, king of Moab, eighteen years. When the children of Israel cried out to the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer for them, Ehud, the son of Gerah, the Benjamite, a left-handed man. By him the children of Israel sent tribute to Eglon, king of Moab. Now Ehud made himself a dagger, it was a double-edged and a cubit in length, and fastened it under his clothes on his right thigh. So he brought the tribute to Eglon, king of Moab. Now Eglon was a very fat man. And when he had finished presenting the tribute, he sent away the people who had carried the tribute. But he himself turned back from the stone images that were at Gilgal and said, I have a secret message for you, O king, he said. Keep silence. And all who attended him went out from him. So Ehud came to him. Now he was sitting upstairs in his cool private chamber. Then Ehud said, I have a message from God for you. So he arose from his seat. Then Ehud reached within his left hand, with his left hand, took the dagger from his right thigh and thrust it into his belly. Even the hilt went in after the blade, and the fat closed over the blade, for he did not draw the dagger out of his belly, and his entrails came out. Then Ehud went out through the courts and shut the doors of the upper room behind him and locked them. When he had gone out, Eglon's servants came to look, and to their surprise, the doors of the upper room were locked. So they said, he is probably attending to his needs in the cool chamber. So they waited till they were embarrassed, and still he had not opened the doors of the upper room. Therefore they took the key and opened them, and there was their master, fallen dead on the floor. But Ehud had escaped while they delayed, and passed beyond the stone images, and escaped to Sierra. And it happened, when he arrived, that he blew the trumpet in the mountains of Ephraim. And the children of Israel went down with him from the mountains, and he led them. Then he said to them, Follow me, for the Lord has delivered your enemies, the Moabites, into your hand. So they went down after him, seized the forts of Jordan, leading to Moab, and did not allow anyone to cross over. And at that time they killed about 10,000 men of Moab, all stout men of valor. Not a man escaped. So Moab was subdued that day under the hand of Israel, and the land had rest for 80 years. It's a very gory passage. But God doesn't put these things in the word of God without a purpose. We sometimes wonder, why do those gory details have to be there? Because like I said, the reason it was written is for our sake. Because the Old Testament is a shadow of what actually happens. And we understand the truth of it, how we apply it in the New Testament. But scripture says there in verse 12, it was... So the land, Levin says, the land had rest for 40 years. Then Othniel, the son of Kenaz, died. And the children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord. As long as, is it a quick? As long as Othniel was there, there was rest. Then Othniel died. What does it mean to us? It means as long as the Lordship of Jesus Christ is there in our life, we have rest. But the minute we move away from the Lordship of Christ, we begin sliding again. And scripture says, the children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord. There they go. And when they did evil in the sight of the Lord, scripture says, God allows the wicked king to have power over them. It says, the Lord strengthened Eglon, king of Moab. It is God who allows. You need to realize, God's hand of protection is always there upon his children. There, the enemy cannot do anything unless the Lord permits. That's why Satan has to ask permission from God before he can touch Job. And here also we will see, when they go out of the covering, 
out in disobedience, God allows the enemy to have power over their lives. And what do they say? Scripture says that King Cain, he gathered Ammon and Amalek and he went and defeated Israel and he took possession of that city. That city is the city of Jericho. And now in verse 14 it says, The children of Israel served a glowing king of Moab for 18 years. 18 years, the children of God, those who are supposed to walk in freedom, those who are supposed to walk in power, in strength, who are supposed to show the whole world the testimony of the living God, is serving the king of Moab for 18 years. And then they began crying. But when the children of Israel cried out to the Lord, the Lord raised a deliverer for them. We don't know when they started crying out. Did they start crying out in the first year? Second year? Or only by the 16th, 17th, 18th year? The question God is asking us, do we start crying out for a deliverer in the beginning of our bondage? Or only when our bondage becomes unbearable? Question. Okay. For Israel, these are real physical enemies. For us, these are not physical enemies. These are spiritual enemies that enslave us in the flesh. Do we start crying out to the Lord for deliverance only after we have become an addict? Or do we start crying out knowing we are moving into bondage? That's the question God is asking. Scripture says for 18 years they were in bondage. 18 years they were in bondage. See the difference is, like I said, these are not the kind of foes which we face. They face the Amalekites, the Perizzites, the Kenizzites, the Jebusites, the Moabites, all kinds of physical foes. But the foes which we face, okay, remember, these were the enemies that were in the land of Canaan. God saved them, brought them out of Egypt, brought them into a land and in that land are these enemies. Which is true for all of us. These enemies are already in the land they were supposed to live and possess. Meaning, when we were saved, the enemies were already in us. They were already in us. We belong to them. And Galatians chapter 5 verses 19 to 21 talks the truth about every believer. This is what with me came in. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. A whole list is given. These are the spiritual counterparts of these nations that are dwelling in Canaan and harassing the Israelites. These are our enemies. And a whole list is given. And God is asking us, are we in bondage to these things? If we are in bondage to these things, how long have we been in bondage? Are we really crying out for deliverance? Or, do we actually like those things? <coughs> do we actually, and we make these excuses. I am that kind of a person. What can I do? That's the way I was. But God says that's not the way you were born again. You were supposed to defeat these enemies. These are the enemies you face. And every time Israel did evil in the sight of God, when we disobey, we rebel, God allows the enemy to take over, give some power. You see, this is there in every one of us sitting here. We all came with this and we still have in different measures. And God says, you need to fight these enemies. And scripture says, he raised a deliverer. For them, the deliverer at that time was a man called Ehud. Before that, it was a man called Othinian. For us, it's always the man called Jesus Christ. He is the deliverer God has raised. And I'm telling you, as long as the lordship of Jesus Christ is there over our lives, the enemies will remain quiet and we will have rest. 
Doesn't matter what outwardly the circumstances are, outwardly what the enemy does, the world does, we will always have rest inside as long as the Lordship of Jesus Christ is there. That's what you see in Israel. As long as there is a judge and he's judging them, they, they have peace outside. To us, God is saying, as long as you allow Jesus Christ in and allow the word of God to judge you constantly and walk in that judgment, you will have rest inside, irrespective of what is happening outside. Or, are we saved? Meaning we are Israel, spiritual Israel. And our old friends are our new foes. The list given in Galatians 5.19 onwards, we don't have to go to that. Those were our old friends. But now, they are our new enemies. Problem, you cannot live with them. These are called the works of the flesh. If you are a child of God, you will be constantly harassed. Galatians 5 and verse 17. It tells you there. What does it say? It says, for the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh and these are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you wish. They are contrary, they are opposites. The things of the flesh and the things of the spirit are contrary and they, you can't do the things which you want to do. The old foes, enemy, uh, friends, are today's enemies. Enemies of who? Of your spirit. Okay. You cannot live with them. You cannot live in peace with them. All your life you will have to battle this. If you try to make peace with them, you are playing with your inheritance. That's what God says. Those who make peace with them will not inherit the kingdom of God. You cannot make peace with them. The problem is, if the sins of the flesh are allowed to remain unchecked, it can grow into gigantic proportions as represented by the king of Moab. Iglon. What does it say in verse 17? 317. Look at how he is described. This. Now, Iglon was a very fat man. Okay. What is this talking about? It is talking that when you have allowed your flesh to have reign over you and continue in that, a time can come because your flesh is huge. It's ruling over your entire life. There are two people in the Bible who are mentioned as fat or heavy. One is Eglon, the other is Eli. And Eli is mentioned as being heavy because he is the high priest of Israel at the time when Israel hits rock bottom. And the ark is taken away from them the first time. And he is also heavy. When spiritual lethargy, spiritual wickedness becomes heavy, Israel loses even the very presence of God from their midst. The symbol of their presence. Remember this, that's what it's talking about. It's saying that Eglon is very, very, very fat. He's very fat. And who is he? What is he called? He is called the king of Moab. Eglon, king of Moab. Now, who is Moab? Moab was the son of Lot through his daughter. Now you need to understand what it's talking about. It's basically talking about a righteous man when he backslid and refused to separate from this world, refused all the chances offered by God even on the day of judgment for him and the nation he was living in, took his family down with him and you move into the grossest form of sin. Drunkenness to the level that you don't even realize the woman next to you is your daughter. And resulting in incest creates a Moab. And Iglon is represented as the big fat king of Moab. Are you getting the picture? God says if you move in the flesh, you don't deal with the flesh, this is where it will end. Who will be finally enthroned in your life? This is where it will end. And that's where God is warning us. Now, 
When Eglon is fat and seated in the, on the throne, it means sin is at his height. Please remember, he did not grow fat in one day. No man grows fat in one day. It's a period of time. No sin comes to a point where it has overpowered your life. Where you are, If you are a drunkard, you are an addict, or you are an absolute drunkard, you have no control over your life, over any particular sin. It doesn't happen in one day. It happens over a period of time. Now, over a period of time, you did not take God's correction, did not take God's checking, and now maybe you are an extremely angry person. It's not that you were born extremely angry. Over a period of time, you allowed, did not allow your anger to be controlled, to be checked, and you allowed it to be give went and went and went and went. And now what has happened is you have become an extremely angry person. Iglon is seated over there. Okay? Or you are an alcoholic. You are an addict. Or you are hooked onto something. It all started in faces. Okay? I don't know what it is. Each one knows what you are actually struggling with, which is the addiction you are struggling with. And it has become big. It may be bitterness. Maybe jealousy, maybe wrath. The whole list is there. So much is given. It can be anyone, many of them, and it is seated over there. It is seated over there. When it comes to Solomon, Solomon in the book of Exodus, remember, he took all these ways. That man is consumed by lust. A man with God's hand upon him, whose name beloved of God, is consumed by lust by the end of his life with 300 wives and 600 concubines. Consumed. Meaning you can begin so well and then one day be the king of Israel, the most well known in the world history, yet Eglon is seated in you, grown big and fat. King of Moab has taken over. This is what God is talking about. This is the reason we continue to study the word of God because it shows us we don't take care of these things. These are the very things that will pull us down ultimately. These are the very things that will pull us down ultimately. Okay, We will lose our inheritance because God says, you did not deal with these things in your life. And then, the more, like I said, he did not grow fat in one day. The more you feed the swine, the fatter it gets. Remember Sunday's message? The more you feed the swine, the fatter it gets. And 18 years later, they are a miserable, miserable lot. The problem is, usually by the time you are ready or you are miserable, longing for your deliverance, usually it's very difficult. A simple sickness which would have taken care of by a simple treatment now requires surgery. How many sicknesses which should have been treated in the beginning and would have been dealt in in one course of antibiotics have now ended up with the body under the surgeon's scalp. That's literally that's going to happen over here. Okay? Because scripture says, praise God, scripture says there is a way out. In Romans 6.23 scripture says the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The wages of sin is death. Sin will lead to death. The wages of sin is death. But, praise God, thank God, the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our God. And you know what? When this man appears, let's go back to Ehud. Now when this man appears, he's the most unlikely hero. He was chosen by the people to take the tribute to the king. And he is chosen for a particular reason. The reason is that Ehud, the son of Gera, of the Benjamite, a left-handed man. Now when we read left-handed man today, it is okay. But Hebrew connotation actually says he uses his left hand because his right hand is deformed. Only after Ganguly and all came left hand shots all became popular. But earlier if you are left handed it was for centuries looked as, as if you were not normal. Because right hand was the hand that everybody used. Though in the book of Judges we will talk about a few thousand Benjamites who could 
split the hair with a sling. But that was not the norm. The norm was right hand was. So everything is seated on the right hand side. It never said seated on the left hand side. Left in this case, this particular case, actually the connotation is his right hand is deformed. He was left handed. His right hand has a deformity. And this is the story, the link we go through every Wednesday. Because it's not strange, if you know our God, that God uses people who have a handicap in life. Have you noticed? Everybody in God's word, everybody in God's word has got a handicap. They are perfect specimens. They would never get a job in today's world. They all have a handicap. Remember Goliath's anger? Why was Goliath so angry? But he came day after day challenging. But finally when the challenger came, he was angry. Because the challenger that was sent was a little boy. Israel has got mighty men. Saul's army has got 600 mighty men. All that is mentioned. Mighty men of Saul. King Saul himself was a head taller and a shoulder taller than everybody else. But the one who is sent to fight is a little boy. Even Samuel thought David's brothers were good and strong and mighty. But not David. But God always picks those who don't fit into our vision. Of what? Who should be a deliverer? Who should be a deliverer? It doesn't fit in with our perception. Okay, please remember, everyone picked by God are special because they had a handicap. And therefore, if you feel spiritually, whatever way, you are handicapped, remember, you have a good chance of being a hero in God's kingdom. You remember Shambar, two Wednesdays back? The Philistines got completely fooled because there stood a poor farmer with an ox goat. They never had to fight a battle like that because they were used to soldiers with spears and swords and shields and armor and everything. And now the Philistines have taken all the blacksmiths away. So there is no spear or no sword and there stands a farmer with an ox goat. Now it's very simple to sit here and smile, not get the real picture. Think about it in the villages of Andhra Pradesh. One of those farmers with his poor dhoti standing or with his oxen standing over there. And God brings a mighty deliverance through one of the such men. They're all nicely dressed in our trousers and shirts and a lot of them in the countryside, they don't dress like that. You go anywhere out of the city, immediately you see changes. They're back to their little dhotis and maybe a bunny and not even a shirt and maybe hold. Imagine God works a mighty miracle through one of those men. That's Shambhar. God always picks people who have nothing to boast about. Remember Jael? The lady? They ask this question. Why did the general of the enemy, Sisera, why did he get into a tent and go to sleep? Because she was a woman. That was her handicap. He never expected a woman would do anything like that. How very handicapped was the strength God used to destroy the enemy. What we looked as, what we see as handicap in Shangar was the very thing God used to destroy 600 Philistines. What was seen as a handicap in Ehud was the very thing that gave him access to the enemy king. And the enemy king even closed the door behind him and said, okay, you talk to me. Are you looking at whatever you are looking at actually has your weakness, which makes you afraid to face the world. God says, you know what? You turn it over to me. I will take that very thing and confound this world. Read Judges 15 and verses 15 and 16. You will see. Trusting. He found a fresh jawbone of a donkey, reached out his hand and took it and killed a thousand men with it. Who is this? But leave Samson, leave his strength alone. The fact that he is facing a thousand Philistines with arms and he's got nothing. And he looks over there, it's the jawbone of a donkey. Now that looks very ridiculous. What can you do with the bone? God says, with that very thing I can bring out a deliverance. And then he sings a song. With the jawbone of a donkey, heaps upon heaps, with the jawbone of a donkey, I have slain a thousand men. NIV will say, I made a donkey out of the donkeys with the jawbone. 
Are you saying it? No. I mean, ask ourselves, unless it is sheer laziness, why is that we don't step forward and say, Lord, here I am? Because we got something there in our spirit. We focus as a handicap and we think, I cannot serve this God because this thing is there. Therefore, I am not fit. And God says, it doesn't work that way. And then, the greatest battle ever fought by man is recorded in Colossians chapter 2 and verse 15. The greatest battle humanity has ever known, this universe has ever known, is in 2.15. This is Jesus on the cross. Having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. Meaning all of Satan's one third of the heavenly hosts which were against Jesus. He just destroyed them with a foolish thing called the cross. It never expected that God would use something like the cross to defeat him. That's why scripture says the cross is foolishness to those who don't believe. But who was the kind of person God used? Not the kind of picture we have from movies and books. Isaiah chapter 53 verse 2 and 3 tells again this is God's format. For he shall grow before him as a tender plant, as a root out of a dry ground. He has no form or comeliness and when we see him there is no beauty that we should desire him. What does he say? He says he doesn't come like John Abraham on a 1500cc bike. <laughs> Where everybody will say, ooh, ah, six pack muscles, nothing of that. What does he say? If you were to look at Jesus on earth, if it weren't for the anointing, you wouldn't give him a second look. You wouldn't give him a second look. The only reason crowds followed him is when he started speaking. Doesn't say crowds followed him before that. There was a crowd around him at 12 when he opened his mouth. That's when the anointing is shown. I seeing it. So the master himself came basically handicapped. Born in a manger, poor carpenter, always a question mark about his birth, lot of rumors floating around, comes from Nazareth and all the scripture says nothing is going to come from Nazareth. Are you getting it? God says that's, that's the norm for everybody sitting here and around the world. How do you think you are? What do you think you are? Are you looking at those things which hold you back, saying that I am no good in the kingdom? God says, no, you, you are ready. You are ready. Do you trust God enough to use you with or in spite of it? Ask yourself, what do you think? Orphan? Ex-alcoholic? Failed in business? Failed in studies? Single parent? What? What's your handicap? What is that you think about? Who was the one picked by the people to take the tribute? Because they said, you're good for nothing else. You know why? Because you got a deformed hand. At least you do this. We don't want to go before the king with this tribute. You go. So a group of people comes and he is the one who leads. And verse 16 says, he has strapped the knife on his right thigh. After he's making, he's, he's saying, the rest of the crowd, the rest of the people are content to live in bondage. But here is a one man who says, I want to get out of this. He has not talked to anybody. He has not discussed with anybody. He is sick and tired of his own bondage. Though the bondage is corporate. Are you getting it? A whole family may be in bondage. But one man or woman or child may decide, I want to get out of this. A whole group of people may be in bondage, but one man or woman may decide, I want to get out of it. That's what happened to Abraham. He wanted to get out of the earth of the Shalya. I'm sick and tired of this. What do you say? Are you waiting for everybody to be delivered so that you can come to your deliverance? Or are you looking for your deliverance? I want to be delivered. Whether my brother on the left or the right hand wants the deliverance. I want my deliverance. It doesn't talk about anybody in his group, what they did. It says, a hood strapped a dagger on his right thigh. He went. And verse 19, what does he say? Scripture says, 
But he himself turned back from the stone images that were at Gilgal and said, I have a secret message for you, O king, he said. Now he is before the Gentile king and he has to make use of that opportunity. We all get opportunities only certain times in life. Next time he goes to pay tribute will be next year. We don't know it's, whether it's an yearly tribute or bi-yearly tribute, we don't know. If it's a yearly tribute, next time he will have access to the king will be a year later. And there is no guarantee next year he will be the one before the king. Getting the picture? God says, make use of every opportunity to stand up for me. Because you never know when that opportunity will come. Ephesians 5 and verse 16. Does it say? Redeeming the time because the days are evil. If today is the day God tells you, or tomorrow, today is anyway in the church, tomorrow you go to your workplace or your church, your classroom, wherever, and God says, today is the day I want you to stand up and tell your unbelieving friend about me, so that Eglon can be defeated in his life, you need to be able to stand up and say, I want to speak. I'm going to speak. You can't keep postponing these things forever because the time maybe may not come by again. Look at again in Colossians chapter 4 and verse 5. Walk in wisdom towards those who are outside redeeming the time. There are those who are outside. There are those set of people we meet. Once we leave the church, we go back home, then we go back to our workplaces. This is whole set of people who are outside. God says, redeem the time. You may not be with them always. God gives us times as to when you can speak. And remember, this is not of a who, this is of God. Because in verse 20, he is very clear. He says, I have a message from God for you. This is not presumption. This is not presumption. This is faith. This is faith. He's not presuming something, meaning this is a man who struggled in his heart, in his spirit over the bondage of Israel and was heard from God. Hearing it? We can be all troubled by a situation and do nothing about it. Discuss about it, have 601 opinions, do all that. And one among them may choose to fast and pray and before God and hear from God as to what the solution is. Getting the point? That's what God is talking about. This man has got a message from God. He's heard. The question is, 18 years Israel is under bondage and how come nobody heard from God? Nobody had a message from God because they were crying they were upset, but they were not willing to go all the way and listen. What's the solution? Do you know how most prayers end? Most prayers end by Amen. Giving God the list and we get up and go. Very rarely do we hear an answer because we don't still wait before God silently to hear what He has to say. Sometimes you don't even have to pray. All you have to do is sit before God silently so that He will speak. Let Him speak. Let the message come from Him. Let the word come from Him and answer to the trouble you are facing, the problems you are facing, the enemies you are facing. Instead of running around, seeking counsel from ten different people, why don't you just first go before God and say, Lord, give me an answer. What should I do? Because sometimes it is wise always to seek God's counsel first. Because if you run to flesh first, you may re receive 10 different reports. You go to God first and then you decide the solution God is giving, I better keep to myself. Nobody is going to... Up Imagine if Ehu that told the company of men who accompanied him with tribute saying, you know what? I am going to kill this man. They would have dropped and run or they would have let him down. We are not going with you. You are putting our lives also into danger. So it's good like him to hear from God as to what he has to say. No? Because he believed that God was with him. 
Because listen to his words after he has killed Eglon in verse 28. He says in verse 28, And he said to them, Follow me, for the Lord has delivered your enemies, the Moabites, into your hand. Are you getting it? He says, Follow me. He doesn't say the Lord will deliver. He says the Lord has delivered. What's the sign of that the Lord has delivered? The king is already dead. The Lord has delivered. His trust and his faith is in God. See, we have to look at the times and of this man. This man is standing there all alone. In a nation. In captivity. All alone. And he goes all alone. King's the king. Comes and blows the trumpet all alone. And then the people come and he says, come, follow me. You know why? Because God has delivered your enemies into your hands. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 5. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think of anything as being from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God. That's the key. That's the key. If you look at the exploits of any man or woman of God in the Bible is when they got this key. I can't do it. But God can do it through me. And it takes a lot of humbling for that. A lot of, lot of humbling. That's where all the things we have learned in life in this world goes against us when we try to move in the kingdom. It goes exactly against us because it doesn't work. That's what Paul is saying. Paul is saying that sufficiency is of God. It's That's why God keeps on saying that he chooses the weak. Because when we are weak, then we are willing to trust him. As long as I am not weak, I still have something to trust on other than him. Not that all weak people will trust in God. Please don't think that weakness therefore will bring trust. But the thing is that when you are weak, the chances of you trusting God is even more. See, Hudson Taylor, if you know, the one who began the Inland China ministry, mission. He said, God is sufficient for God's work. God chose me because I was weak enough. Any one of you, anyone in the world who gets a job, a good job or whatever job, will you say that? I was chosen because I was weak enough? No. M said, results will come tomorrow or today or something, medical entrance results will come, all results will come. And the usual thing we say is that, I got it because I was good enough. God's servants in his words always have recognized that I was chosen because I was weak enough. I was weak enough for God to God to manifest his power. So there is Eglon, massive and seated on the throne. And God is asking us today, how strong is your bondage? Now go to verse 21 and 22 and we will see why those gory details. Then Ehud reached with his left hand, took the dagger from his right thigh and thrust it into his belly. Even the hilt went in after the blade. Okay. Now I believe that he did not make it with a big what belt. Who definitely would have stopped. He made it where the handle and the blade was one piece. But with the force he hit, the whole knight went in. What's God saying? In your battle against the enemy, are you going to do, like I said, peck peck, peck peck, or are you really seriously determined about your victory? You want to win this battle. Seven days fasting is over. If you don't get your victory, will you go on to the 14 days? At the end of 14 days, what you are looking for, you still didn't get you overcome. Will you go to 21 days? At 21 it doesn't come, will you go to 40 days? How desperate you are that I want to overcome this issue in my life of God. I have been captive to that for long enough. I want my victory. It's not that 7 is a magic number and at the 7th day the victory will come. No. It may take more than that. 
But God is saying, how willing are you? How, are you? how serious are you about these things? How serious are you? How serious are you about your victory? Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 17. Does God say there? He says, now take the helmet of salvation, leave that aside for today, and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. He says, take the sword of the spirit. And do what with that? Hebrews 4.12. The word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Piercing even to the division of the soul and the spirit and of the joints and the marrow. That's what he did. All the way in. He's a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. God says, you want your deliverance. Are you willing to apply the sword of the spirit that way? Like I told you, Eglon for us is a spiritual enemy. Somewhere seated in our life. Are you willing to use the word of God and go all the way? Because if it is really seriously applied and applied deep, the immediate results are often very ugly. <laughs> what does scripture say there? Out of his belly what came? Entrails. Simple physical manifestation is we will come to your ear and say this is what the Lord says come out in the name of Jesus you start throwing up. It's not a very nice thing to see. It's not a nice thing to see. But that's just a simple manifestation. But what I'm saying is that even when you're doing it personally it's beyond that. If you really want your deliverance. You should be willing to apply the sword of the spirit deep within to the discerning of even the intents and the thoughts of your heart, not your mind, of your heart. It's like peeling the onion. It can be a very painful process. Painful process. Lord, my marriage is in shambles. Lord, I'm praying for restoration. God says, really? What do you mean by that? I want my husband to be happy with me or my wife to be happy with me or do you really want deliverance? He. Do you really want your deliverance? He says if you really want your deliverance, you put the sword deep within until every muck comes out. Are you willing or to go all the way? Then from there I will begin the restoration. Are you ready? People back off. No, I am not ready. If you are ready, God will take the sword and expose. He says, you know where your relationship started? 25 years ago, do you know how it started? Everything was based on a lie. Everything was based on a lie. There was nothing true about your whole relationship. There was nothing of me. Everything was based on a lie. Are you willing to be exposed that way? This is a lie, this is a lie, this is a lie, this is a lie. This. The minute we come to that, we back off and say, no, 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 I don't want deliverance. I just want a covering. Antiseptic is enough. Just put it over and put a bandage over it. That's enough for me. He wants to go under the surgeon's scalpel. Imagine you got a tumor inside and you put some detol over it and put a bandage over it. But that's okay. Spiritual things people are okay because as long as people don't know I have cancer, it is fine. I would rather live with cancer and not, not let anybody know about it than have it removed. That's what God is talking about. When the sword of the spirit goes in, all the way in, it will throw a lot of muck out. It will all come out. And sometimes you must be willing to lose face. So that you can be really restored and delivered. Really, really restored and delivered. The problem is the fear. The fear. Like I told you, the primary example God puts in the Bible, always in the Bible about these two uses of the sword is Saul and David. Saul and David. The sword of the Spirit, the word of God was sent by God through to Saul through Samuel. And Saul says, it is okay, as long as you stand next to me, it's fine, I have obeyed the Lord, I have obeyed. Please don't keep on telling me that I have not obeyed, I have obeyed. Even the sound that you are hearing, forget it, I have obeyed. He doesn't want any surgery in his life. 
You stand beside me. As long as the people seeing the prophet standing beside me, they will think God is with me. The next king has gone even more down to the pits he's. And he sent a lesser prophet. And the prophet looks at him and says, you are that man. The sword goes in deep. It says, I am that man. Restore me. Restore me. I don't want any bandage. I don't want that. He says, you know what? You have shown the intents of my heart. Therefore, you know what? Create in me a clean heart. In the years I ran, all these years, everybody thought I was good. I was a mighty warrior for God, anointed king, God's own man, everything. But now that you have come and spoken to me, I realize my heart is not so clean. Use the sword and rip me apart. I'm ready. I'm ready for your work. God is asking, are we ready for that kind of a work of God to be used that way by God to bring deliverance to a nation? The key is that. The key, if you look in by biblical history and church history down till today, is that whenever a man or a woman has been willing for God to use his sword in him, he has used them to bring deliverance to nations. That's the key. God is saying, are you willing? The minute Isaiah saw the heavens open, the sword went into his heart. And he said, woe unto me, I am a man of uncleanness. This told Peter, put the net that side. Put it, came full. As soon as he looked at it, he looked at him, the sword went deep in. He said, depart from me. I am a sinful man. Did Job say at the end of it, I abhor myself. I abhor myself. I'm good. I'm useless. That's what the sword does. That's exactly what the sword does. The sword suddenly shows you and then you're ready for the deliverer to start working. No? Because most of our deliverances can end up being superficial. Because we are not willing for God to cut deep and expose the entrails. The entrails fell out. We are not willing for the entrails to fall out. And God says, are you willing to everything to come out so that I can restore you? But if you do, then there is freedom and rest. Freedom and rest. Look at Psalm 90 verses 7 to 10. For we have been consumed by your anger and by your wrath we are terrified. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your countenance. For all our days have passed away in your wrath. We finish our years like a sigh. The days of our lives are 70 years and if by reason of strength they are 80 years. Yet their boast is only labor and sorrow. For it is soon cut off and we fly away. He says, how much do we get? 70 years. Maximum, 8 years. But even that 8 years is only labor and sorrow. Sorrow and labor. Even that too is cut off. But look at the, how chapter 3 ends. It says, and the land had rest for 80 years. Not labor and sorrow, rest for 80 years. He said, like, I'll give you rest for 80 years if you're willing to go all the way with the sword of the spirit. I'll give you rest. I'll give you rest all the days of your life. I will give you rest. And rest is important in the Bible. Rest is important in the Bible. It's very, very important in the Bible. He says, I will give you rest. So this is the whole battle scripture is talking about. The battle of the flesh against the spirit. They cannot live together. And if anybody is thinking that they can, you can make peace and live in conformity with the flesh and the flesh and the spirit will have a truce, it never will happen. And if you do, you are fooling yourself. You are fooling yourself. The flesh and the spirit will never have a truce. And if you have a truce, then you are not born again. That's simple as that. If you have a truce where your flesh is comfortable and the spirit is comfortable with what your flesh is doing, 
go back and check whether you are really born of the spirit. If you are born of the spirit, you will never be comfortable with the flesh. You will struggle, you will be miserable, you will fight. And finally one day you will get up and say, I am going all the way. I don't, I don't care what it costs me. I want my freedom. I was not born to be this. Romans 13 and verse 14 will give us a few solutions. Yes. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. You know what provision is? Provision is what we store in our storeroom. In old homes when we all grew up, there was a storeroom. Today's contractors will give you two shelves. Old days we had storerooms. The storeroom was where we stored stuff for a later use. Are you getting it? Yes. He says, do not make provision. Are you getting it? Do not make provision for... You may not do it today, but you kept it for a rainy day. <laughs> Whatever it is, you have kept it for a rainy day. God says, don't do that. Do not keep any, make no provision for the flesh. Identify when you were in the world, what were the things you struggled with. Do not make provision for them. Cut that off completely. Cut that off completely. And if we, people think that we are being very legalistic and fundamentalistic and all say, stop watching movies, stop watching TV, stop listening to that, stop reading that. And they say, what's the fun in life? Because this is about your inheritance. You're making provision. You're making provision. There is nothing the world will offer you which is 100% clean. There's nothing like that. So, if you are struggling or were struggling in an area, don't make any provision in that. Cut off. Throw it away. Cut it off. No trace of it that in your life, in your home. Take and throw it away. Do not make provision. If it's music, get rid of those CDs. If it is books, get rid of those books. If those are clothes, get rid of those clothes. Whatever it is, do not make provision. Do not make provision. Do not make provision. It's people, get rid of those people. Things, get rid of. Don't mean, mean go and shoot those people. I don't mean it. Break off. It's about you. If our things, if it is food, start fasting. Start fasting. Can you really fast for seven days? Stuff. You know what? That means... Food has egg loan is seated in your belly. You're struggling. So don't start with seven days, start with one day or two days, but get into the habit of learning to fast. It's 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 terrible. Especially if it's somebody like me who also has to fast and also to make nice things for the children. <laughs> Today he came from school and I was making his snack and I'm fasting. Okay. And it is it's not even reaching the brain, it's hitting the spine straight up. What? Don't make provision. Don't make provision. The reason God enjoins us to fast is that when we fast and the flesh is shut down and we start praying. We start hearing from God more clearly. We start. God says do not make provision for the flesh. First Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 27. First Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 27. Discipline my body and bring it to subjection. Lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. You getting it? He says, you need to discipline your body. See, I can sit there, watch any number of programs, any number of videos of people with six packs. I'm not going to get six packs. Until I decide I am going to pay the price, go to the gym five days a week, two hours, and do that until you feel you can't walk anymore. Then you realize the packs have started appearing. Now you know why people all like the prosperity gospel? Because no discipline is required. Name it, claim it, take it, go home. But the preacher takes it home, not you. <laughs> no discipline is required. Absolutely no discipline is required. But God says it doesn't work that way. Absolute discipline is required now. If you are young, start now. 
Start now. Start now. Work. 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 Work now. Harden your body now when you are young so that the day when the Lord calls you, you are ready physically. You cannot start serving the God at 40 when He calls you if you have never exercised in your life. So the habit of fasting, the habit of studying the word, the habit of praying, all should be inculcated now when you are young and you are saved. Begin that now. Dude, he says, I bring my body to subjection. I bring, I bring my body to subjection. Now, now I do it. So that after having preached, I shouldn't be disqualified. What does he mean? He says that, though I know the truth, I don't have the strength in this body to keep the truth because I, I'm indulging in this body all the time. When I should be sitting and studying the word, I realize I don't have a habit. What we tell kids right away when they are small, we tell parents, make them read, make them read, make them read, make, let them get to the habit of reading. Make them read, make them read, make them read. Why? A day will come. Keep speaking to them, reading to them, a day will come that it is, the habit is already inculcated. Most people, young people struggle to read two pages. So they have, do not have a habit. Five minutes, if you are able to pray, it's a miracle. I'm not saying that you should do all this in the flesh, but you're subjecting your body and when you're willing and doing the anointing comes to help you because God knows you are serious. And Paul says that I subject, bring my body to subjection. Ephesians 5 verses 22 to 25. I'm making it very simplistic, okay? The subjection goes into deeper levels. 5 verses 22 to 24. Submitting. Was it 5? Four, 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 not five. That's also a submitting, by the way. <laughs> that you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. You know what scripture is saying? Simple example. You can't wear two coats at the same time. Wear one coat at a time. You know what? 21st century teaches. Christianity teaches us. You can put the lust of the flesh and the spirit at the same time. God says you can't. You have to take one off and put the other. That's when people get upset. You can't. God says you cannot. You have to take, put off and put on. Put off and put on. Put off and put on. And the problem is, the one which you have to take off, we are very comfortable in it. Because we have worn it for a long, long time. For children, for an older person, if you are given a new shoe and an old comfortable shoe, you will pick the old comfortable shoe. It's very comfortable. New only looks good, but when you're walking in it, it's giving you a bite. You have to put off. You don't like putting off because you're very comfortable with it. What we have to put on, we are not comfortable because it gives us a bite. It's called spirit bite. But God says, put off and put on. Put off and put on. Galatians 5 and verses 24 and 25. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. For if you live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. He says there is something which you have to do. If you are in Christ, you have crucified the flesh. That's why Jesus said, pick up your cross daily and walk with me. It's a daily process, every day, every day. You may fall today, tomorrow is another day, fresh day. You pick up your cross and say, yes, I know, I know these are the things which I need to do. I know, I need to do. Over and over. How is something good formed? How a good habit formed? By doing the same things over and It's a very monotonous thing. But the good things in the kingdom of God are very monotonous. 
not looking for something that is titillating, monotonous things, doing the same things over and over and over and over and over again. And God says, do it. That's how habits are formed. Even spiritual habits. That's why Peter thought he was very smart. I think it was Peter who told Jesus, how many times should I forgive my brother? Seven times? Jesus said, no. Seven times, seventy. Get that habit. So that by the time you come to 150th, 200th time, as the brother is coming, you say, forgiven. <laughs> he must have come to borrow your shoes or pen or something. But now you are so used to forgiving, you say, forgiven. You don't hold anything. You don't hold anything at all. Because it has been a practice. You have practiced. You have practiced giving. You have practiced giving. God says God loves a cheerful giver. But everybody doesn't begin giving cheerfully. Everybody begins giving grudgingly. Because there is fear inside. But don't stop giving. The more you start giving grudgingly, you will see joy also starts coming. But there is always joy in coming. Because that's God's word. In the book of Acts, Paul says it's more blessed to give than to receive. And as you give, 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 you also realize it's a cycle. That you can never outgive God. You can never outgive God. And then you realize this, it's become a habit. Now there is no worry at all. There is no worry at all when the whole world is shaking. There is no worry at all. The whole world is in a mess. You are not reading the news or the papers. The latest job report says one out of ten people in America don't have a job. It's gone down. Even more worse. Europe is in a mess. There is no money to bail out Portugal and Spain. All are going down. We don't know when Japan will come out of recession, whether they will ever come out of the recession. The whole Middle East is in flames. The price of crude is going up. All the government leaders are shaky. They have no clue what is going to happen. They are trying to appease the population by saying, hold on, nothing is, but that's not the truth. But if you have tapped into God's principle, where you have broken the chain of fear, by tapping into a habit where he said, you realize it doesn't matter. When you go to the petrol pump, you are not even looking at the price of petrol. It doesn't matter to you. You don't look at the labels over there, what is the price which is the cheapest. It doesn't matter to you. Still go back to your usual counter because you realize you have broken a glen in your life. He doesn't have any power over you anymore because you have tapped into something else. You tapped into something else. Because as he said, it's your word of God that I have obeyed. That's the key. Sometimes it's very difficult to pronounce the word of God because when you pronounce the word of God, you may be pronouncing the word of God over yourself also. Getting it? But you trust that God. You, he told you to do it. He did not tell you about the results. The result is in God's hands. But because you know him, you are willing to obey him. That's exactly what Elijah did. He went and told Ahab, until my word comes again, there is going to be no rain in Israel. God told him, you go to chariot. And he is sitting there at chariot. And he is watching. Because by pronouncing there is going to be no rain over Israel, he has pronounced judgment upon himself. Because he is seeing the water in the brook is getting lesser and lesser and lesser because there is no rain on Israel. Are you getting it? No rain in Israel. He did not say it will not rain in all over Israel except where I am sitting it will keep raining. No, he pronounced judgment also over Israel himself. But he is believing his God will take care of him even as he subjects himself to the very same judgment. But you need to believe. And God tells you to do something and says, you are also subject to the same law and you pronounce it, you are saying, my God is, will take care of me. I believe you. That's real faith. I believe you, God. I believe you, God. I believe you. You will take care of me. You will take care of me. You will take care of me. And one day he looks, the brook is dry. And when the brook is dry, God comes and tells him, you get up and go. I made provision for you. Provision for me? Yes, another handicapped person is over there who looks her life as an handicap, a poor widow. I'm going to do a miracle in Israel for the prophet through that handicapped person. I don't use rich widows. I use poor widows. He used a rich widow for a life, not a married woman for Elisha. But a poor widow... 
God says, that's the kind I use. That's the kind I use to break this cycle. Please remember, this is God's cycle always. It takes one man or one woman. One man or one woman to catch the vision of God and say, Lord, here I am. I am nobody. When people look at me, they laugh at me. Why? Because my hand is like this. So they think I can't do anything. God says, good, I can do something with you. Because your right hand can't move, nobody will believe that you can kill with your left hand. Come, I will use you. Man, one woman who will believe. I got this some time back. Beautiful, somebody had said, it takes one tree to start a forest. You know that? It takes only one tree to start a forest. It takes only one star to guide a ship. It takes only one vote to change a nation, if it's a casting vote. And it takes only one life to make a difference. And God says, today, will you be that? One life. It takes one life to make a difference to an entire nation. But there is a price you will have to pay in the flesh. You will have to pay. That is when Eglon is killed. Title of today's message, when Eglon is killed. That's when freedom comes. That's when one man can lift up the trumpet and blow and says, follow me. Follow me. And God will work out a deliverance. Shall we pray? Father, we come to you, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Your ways and your plans and your thoughts are so different. So different, so different. You're building men and women. Faithful, committed, consecrated, separated. Who will deliver multitudes, communities, nations. And one day they will take their place beside you on the throne. Because you, they allowed you to work character in them. So that they could rule with you one day, O oh Father. O oh Father, help us. Help us to know this. That through all that we go through, what you are trying to work in us is your character. So many kings in our life. Some are big and fat like Eglon. And only the sword of the spirit can cut deep and uproot him from the throne. It may cost us our name, our reputation, because the entrails may come out. It may cost us everything. The word also says if we keep our soul, we will lose it. But if we lose our life for your sake, we will find it. We are not looking for a face or a reputation today. We are looking for life. Life that comes from above. And for that, O oh God, every fake and false king in our life should die. Christ and Christ alone must live. Give us the courage to take the sword of the Spirit and apply it deep into our lives. Give us the courage, O oh God, especially during these days as we seek your face. Thank you, Father. For in Jesus' precious name we pray.